my name is uh, Stefan Wirth. I'm in appeals counsel with the ICGR now for like five and a half years. And could you like set the stage for me? Like, by the time you arrived, was there still a sense that this was kind of a frontier? I mean, I, I had worked at the, at the ICTY before, so I, I, I knew what what was coming. So it wasn't it wasn't as as uh, many things weren't weren't as new as they were originally, but. Um, the great thing about international criminal law is that there's always something new. There's always something that happens for the first time. Like in each case, there are several things that, that happen for the first time, but I really have to think, oh, how am I going to deal with that? So I guess the, the tribunals, the ad hoc tribunals, will never really lose their, their, that sense of being at the frontier. But it's certainly... Um, yeah, there's more routine now, nevertheless. Could you just tell us a little bit about your background, your professional background? Sure. I, I uh, studied in, in Freiburg and I worked a little bit at the university and then I worked at the Max Planck Institute for International uh, Criminal Law, that's also in Freiburg. And from there I went to the ICTY in 2002. Um, also in, in 2001-2002 I, I uh, worked with the German delegation for the, for the International Criminal Court, so I was Participated in the ICC negotiations in New York for for a few sessions of the uh, preparatory committee, and um, so then I stayed at the ICTY until 2010, and then I came here to the ICTR. And what motivated you coming to the ICTR? I guess a little bit of sense of adventure. I always wanted to to I always wanted to work abroad. And and uh, the Hague is not as as abroad as one might wish, so I, I was looking for for like places that were I don't know newer to me, not really more challenging. I don't really think that Arusha is a very challenging place, but I wanted I really wanted to live to live in in, in this part of the world for for a while and and to work in this um, uh, in this part of the world and also. Uh, having worked for for like eight years or so at the at the ICTY, I, I wanted to to deal with a different set of facts. The laws is very similar, but the facts of the genocide in Rwanda are are quite different from the facts of of what happened in in the states of the former Yugoslavia. So that was also interesting, like to take the same legal framework and apply it to a very different uh, set of facts. Uh, have there been any defining cases for you that are, are particularly memorable or meaningful? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I ran the Enzabuni Mana case. That was the first case where I, where I was uh, acting as lead counsel. That was really uh, interesting and it was great to lead a team and to, to try to have a team make the best possible arguments. Um, uh, and actually, we were we were quite successful in this appeal. Also, it was a very good experience. And then, obviously, the Butara case, which um, which I worked on, which you'll know, we get we get the judgment in like two weeks from now. Um, that case was very challenging because uh, it had run for like ten years or so, and um, there's an enormous amount of material. And on appeal, we needed to to review tens of thousands of pages of transcripts, and and uh, uh, like hundreds of of motions and filings and decisions at trial. So that was it was a it was a very it was a challenging case because um, uh, the 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 amount of facts that one had to deal with. Um, I had legally interesting uh, uh, cases more at the ICTY, if you want me to talk about these. I mean, I, I guess I would be interested in, in the ways in which they are different or, or ways in which you found like what you learned at sure. ICTY did or did not prepare you for, right. for here. Uh, uh, legally speaking, um, The, the perpetrators in the Rwandan genocide were more hands-on. So, um, in in most of the cases, the or in most of the incidents that we adjudicate um, or that we prosecute, I have to say, um, 
the um, accused was at the crime site. And um, at the ICTY, the accused mostly are not at the crime site. So you have to, you have to, uh, it's more important to look at the link between the accused and the crime because it's much more difficult to establish. Mm. At the ICTR, um, I sometimes feel that the reliability of the evidence is a little bit more of a problem. And I think there, a lot of that is because um, a certain amount of miscommunication between what we as as lawyers uh, uh, expect and what the witnesses expect, and so sometimes when you when you're talking to a witness or when you're reading uh, the transcript of a witness, in my case, you it's not quite clear what he's or she's talking about. That is an issue that that is makes establishing the facts more challenging here at the ICTR uh, uh, on, on occasion. That's an issue that is, that is not as pertinent at the, at the uh, ICTY. What, what's your approach to creating an argument? Because there, there seems to be an emphasis on constructing a narrative. Oh, that's, that's sure. I mean, ad advocacy, which is basically like ultimately what, what, what you're what you're trying to do is you try to figure out the case. Uh, you try to see what the position is you want to take. And then you advocate for that position. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're, that you're spinning things, or, but it means that you explain them as, as good as possible to, to your audience. Um, I think the, the most important thing for, for lawyers uh, advocating before, before a court is, is clarity. So the court, because if the court doesn't understand what you want, the court can't give it to you. Um, generally, constructing an argument, um, one of the most important things is to lead with your conclusion, which is something that, that obviously as a, as a novel writer, you, you certainly don't do, right? you, you, you don't say, a, uh, the gardener killed uh, the... I don't know, the Baroness, right? This is not how you start. But in, in advocacy, that's how you start exactly. Um, so the important thing is the reader knows where you're going at all times, and that's why uh, you start with your conclusion. You, you, um, also, you try to be as structured as possible. You tell the reader um, or the, the, the listener, if you're making oral arguments, um, uh, the, the sequence of the arguments that you're going to make. So you give what we call a roadmap of your of your arguments. Um, then once you set all that out, and, and you you in your roadmap you also try to to throw in your, your strongest points already. So so they're already foreshadowed. So it, basically, it's it's try to do everything as early as possible. Am I too detailed? No. Okay. No, no, I'm, I'm curious about that. <clears throat> okay. Then then in the in the body of your argument, so you, you set out everything, you, you set the stage, and then you start, you start the, the convincing, right? First you explain them what you want and what your arguments are going to be, and then you make the actual arguments. And there, what really matters, the one thing that matters is that you give all the details um, that are relevant. I mean, not irrelevant details, but you have to give details. You can't go with generalities. You can't say the trial chamber carefully analyzed the evidence. You have to say the trial chamber analyzed this witness who said that. It analyzed this witness who said that. This witness who said that. From these three witnesses, it, it reasonably concluded um, that and that and that. And the defense uh, has not shown why that line of reasoning uh, would not have been um, reasonable, which is the standard. Um, so the, the for for. That what advocates say is persuasion lies in detail. Right? So these are basically the, the, the two important points. One is you really take the reader or the listener by the hand, tell them everything that you're going to do in the sequence you're going to do it, and then when you make the arguments, you give them everything so they, they, they can, themselves can be convinced. Right? They, because it's, it's, it's not sufficient that you're convinced. You have to, you have to 
help them that they in the after having read the brief they, they have to nod and say yeah that makes a lot of sense that's actually how I see it too so that's the yeah that's that's uh, that's framing an argument I just remember getting this distinct impression that like when I was watching you argue that this is someone that likes movies <laughs> or something that likes and maybe maybe it's totally and maybe I'm projecting entirely, but like. But Are you talking about Butaro or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just and, and just like the the, the not only the like sort of audiovisual yeah. elements, um, but also the uh, intentional attempt to humanize the facts. And actually, and that's something that I left out when what I just said. That that's another thing. And, and yes, um, I think one of the shortcomings of international criminal law um, is that we often we don't tell the story and and um, the story is ultimately what shows you why an accused should be punished right why should someone go to to jail for the rest of of his life that's a that's Yeah, that, that's a very, very extreme punishment, a very strong punishment, right? And in order to explain that, you have to show what he actually did. And, and you can't, that's not done when you say he killed 200 people, right? That's done if you, if you manage to recreate to a certain extent the, the suffering of these people, how they, I mean, they, they don't went to a hill and there they were killed, right? They were stumbling on that hill. They were, they were crawling through the mud. They were dodging bullets. Children were crying. The cattle was roaring, right? Uh, rain was coming down. They, 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 they couldn't feed their children, right? And at the same time, they, they were afraid of the next morning when the soldiers would come or the, the attackers would come again and, and start shooting and macheting them, them down. You have to try to recreate that story because otherwise... Um, the 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 especially on appeals, right? Where the appeal the appeals chamber didn't sit through the trial. They they only know of of these details, basically what you tell them. So yes, I I I think what we really need to to bring out uh, as as strongly as possible is is the the enormous suffering and, and the enormous horror of 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 what what happened in these in these uh, 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 conflicts to the victims. Has that changed you at all, having to live for so long, first at the ICTY and now this, with the, the sort, of, sort of daily bloodbath? No, no, not really. And actually, this is why I say it's a shortcoming of international criminal law, because everything we get is quite sanitized. Right? The thing is this, if you, if you talk to a, a victim of horrible crimes, right? they usually have a tendency to tell it to you in the most neutral terms because they don't want to re-traumatize themselves, right? So they, they tell it to you in a very distant way. If you don't find a way to, to make it a little bit more lifelike by whatever means, I mean, not necessarily by re-traumatizing the victim, but whatever you have, um, then you get a very sanitized story. Right, that has only these these bare bones facts, and and that is a lot of what we what we read on appeal because obviously on appeal we're just we're just reviewing the review of trial, has this sanitized nature, and so I mean I've, the the only time I have been like secondarily traumatized was actually from a from a book I read about the genocide when there was there was the one event that was described was so horrible that I don't know like for for six months or a year I it. it I, I had these flashbacks, kind of, of, of that event, but never from our records, unfortunately. And I think, um, I think it's not a good sign that that uh, that I'm I'm so unaffected by all of this because the, the horror was was there, and apparently we didn't manage to to uh, bring it out and to transport it uh, uh, to the judges. Which also explains some of our of our uh, decisions, I think, where we where we get like surprisingly low sentences for for horrible crimes. It's because it wasn't. That's that's I. Uh, that's how how I rationalize it. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I I always had the feeling that, especially on appeals, we 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 were, we needed to bring out more, 
of 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 the horrors that 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 happened, when, and also of the personality of the accused, mm -hmm. right? I mean, how 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 they they did things, how how they were trying to to lie at trial, how they um, how they behaved at the time, uh, y like using their their authority, bullying people, and doing horrible things. Right, all these you you need to put a little flash on the bones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like justice was done for Rwanda? I don't think every every anything can ever bring full justice to to the victims of this conflict. That's not possible. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen through the ICTR. It's not going to happen through the local proceedings in 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 Rwanda. Um, I think what we did is we established a general consensus that a genocide occurred in Rwanda and 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 horrible things happened and and hundreds of thousands of people were were killed. So it's a little bit like with with Nazi Germany, right? Uh, it's it it became a we helped making this thing a historical fact. Which like avoids what what has happened in many other situations where 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 crimes are simply denied, right? And and victims were sent away and said, Ah, come on, this never happened. This is not. This is you can't do this after the ICTR. I think in 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 that respect, um, um, we help to 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 bring some justice. Obviously, we also brought some justice to a, few, to a few individual victims, but there were obviously like many, many, many more victims than than the ones uh, whose whose perpetrators we prosecuted. Is there, is there anything else that you, you you'd like to just touch on? Like uh... I mean, one one thing um, because people often often ask what's like what what what's the achievement? What what has international criminal law as such? Mm -hmm. ICTY, ICTR, ICC. Uh, the, the Sierra Leone Tribunal and all these places, the Cambodia Tribunal, what have they achieved? And I think the one thing they did achieve is, I remember when I, when I went to school, if horrible crimes happened somewhere, right, uh, the, the reaction and the public reflex was to have Amnesty International write letters. Mm -hmm. Today, the reaction and the public reflex is, let's have prosecutions. Right? And Amnesty International themselves today are very, very strongly opposed to amnesties. So, so um, I think what we, what we did in international criminal law is we shifted, or we, we made it clear that these kinds of, of macro-criminality, this kind of macro-criminality is uh, actually is a crime like other crimes and, and needs to be prosecuted. I think that is something that we that that we did achieve in in the like 20 years that now we have international criminal justice